Okay. Um, so the world is already non-dual. We don't have to make it that way. Um, we have to notice it, that it is so. And we can do so because we hope the brain is wired for unity. Um, there we go. So this is not something new. People have noticed this for a very long time. And we have great many records of this. And when unity or non-duality is realized, it is experienced uh, as having two sides. On one side, there is the absolute component of it, which is all-pervading, contexted, and encompasses all our experience. And the other aspect of it is the interdependence of the relative. All the relative phenomena are unified. And one thing I want to stress today that is relevant to our experience is that there is no part of our experience that has to be rejected. All of this is unity. Everything that we experience is already non-dual. So we have this lab at NYU where we try to look into what happens in the brain when people experience non-dual states to the best they can in these types of uh, environments, which are somewhat unnatural. Now, even though we have this potential, we don't usually experience non-duality. It is something that most of us regard as very rare and very special, but perhaps a peak experience. What we usually experience is duality, a very strong fragmentation of the field of our experience into what is me and what is not me, the self and the other, the good and the bad, the inside and the outside, and the struggle between the two. Now, some people have said, well, there is no such thing. You know, really what's happening is, you know, philosophers and psychologists, they made this duality up so they have something to do. <laughs> I don't think so. It's very real, and it creates enormous amount of unnecessary suffering on this planet. So, do we have to have it? It seems like that there is a biological basis for non-duality, I'm sorry, for duality, which is in the functioning of the immune system. The immune system's job is to tell what is our body and what is not our body. And also, when we look at the networks in the brain, a number of different networks exist in the cortex, but all of them can be seen as belonging to two large networks, one that deals with the self-referential intrinsic processes, and the other that deals with the extrinsic, with the processes that have to do with our being in the environment, um, doing tasks, doing things. And these two networks, if you look at their signal, you can see that they're anti-correlated. For a period of time, a whole bunch of areas in the brain are going to have elevated activity, and then they're going to subside, and a whole bunch of other areas are going to have elevated activity. So the two large global systems seem to work in opposition to each other, much like the dualistic nature of our experience. So maybe there is nothing we can do about it. But actually, for a very, very long time, people have tried to do something about duality and find ways to manage it. So one obvious way is that if you have two things, and it, it's bugging you that there are two things, yeah? You don't like it. So one way to deal with it is to go, OK, I'm just going to get rid of one of those things, and I'm going to have one left. So one way to do it is to say, OK, I'm just going to ignore the environment. Everything out there, the life, it's 
terrible. I'm just going to go inside and have my own experience and forget about anything out there. And that has been done for centuries, of course. And when you look at the brain, when people are engaged in those kind of a contemplative practices, you see increase of activity in the medial parts of the brain having to do with this intrinsic system, uh, self-referential system. Now, a very important realization comes out of these practices. And this realization is that how the world, how we experience the world, is entirely dependent on our mind. Or as today we will say, it's dependent on our brain. But sometimes we take that conclusion one step too far, and we conclude that, therefore, everything we experience is merely imaginary. The other way to deal with duality is to do the opposite thing, to say, the self, I'm going to get rid of the subjective side of my experience, and I'm just going to dedicate to the objective, to the environment, to others, and so on, forget the self. And this is very common approach in the Buddhist meditation and many other contemplative practices. It has ethical imperatives and so on. But again, it's a kind of a attempt to get rid of one of the side and have only, only, the, only the, the other. And so what you see is basically activity in the lateral sides of the brain, and you see decrease of activities on the right in the medial sides of the brain. And what happens is you can, people have done these things also without any kind of contemplative practice in uh, things like a flow or um, uh, getting into the zone. And we know that many things in life can actually be uh, uh, done better if we temporarily let go of our subjective uh, viewpoint, our subjective evaluation of experience. But then we want to ask ourselves, do we want to actually be zombies? Do we want to live without subjective um, evaluation of experience. And that is not necessarily a great idea, as we know from the history of human society. And also, as we know from how the brain works. The intrinsic systems, those that are related to self-related processes, actually form a large part of what we think of as human consciousness, what it is to be human. So getting rid of it, perhaps is not the best long-term strategy. So there is a better way, I think, and some, many others, called non-duality. And in non-duality, we're not trying to get rid of subjective experience or objective side of the experience. What we're trying to, what we're trying to do is realize that they're actually naturally united and that there is a context that actually reveals that they're already unified. So we took some experienced meditators, we put them into a scanner, and they either look at the blank screen with a little red dot, or they look at these naturalistic movies, and we're asking what happens to their, these two large systems in the brain, the extrinsic and intrinsic, um, when they uh, are in this kind of meditation, they're either experiencing non-duality, or doing a kind of a focus thing where they really focus on something outside of themselves and forget uh, themselves. And so what we find is in the middle of this uh, chart is uh, here is a, the resting state. And over here, if they focus very strongly, the anti-correlation, the segregation between these two networks increases. So the two systems come further apart functionally, but if they're, oops, if they're in a non-dual state, then the two systems become less anti-correlated, they become more functionally integrated. So the whole brain works in a more integrated way during non-duality. Now what makes this possible? It turns out that there is part of our consciousness which is not divided. It comes before words, it comes before all constructs, uh, and before uh, even propositional uh, symbols. It is empty awareness, 
and it's always here in the background of our experience. But it's very subtle, and it's hard to notice because our minds are very busy. And so when we looked at our data, we, we saw something interesting, a part in, in the brain called precuneus that drew our attention, and we thought this might be something where we should look further. And so we looked, did some further studies, and what we find in this uh, particular uh, chart is that an area in the precuneus, in the center of the uh, medial, in the medial parietal area, becomes very strongly connected functionally to areas in the dorsal lateral part of prefrontal cortex, which have to do with working memory, with decision making, and so on. And what is significant about this is that this is a connection between the central part of the intrinsic system with a kind of a very dynamic, uh, important part of the extrinsic system. So that the two areas become uh, connected together. So to conclude, non-duality includes both intrinsic and extrinsic experience, self and other in a more integrated relationship. And the solution is really to look at the plasticity of networks to understand how this is uh, instigated in the brain. It is an old proposal that to realize this non-duality actually decreases our suffering. So I would like to end by asking you a question. Would you rather be perfect or would you rather be free? Thank you.